Good morning, everybody. Thank you for choosing to spend your day with us today. Um, we are going to do this presentation about CMTS, the Compliance Monitoring Tracking System, um, this morning. And um, we first, we kind of want to know where you guys all are coming from and how often you use CMTS. My name is Kara Poli, and I'm going to be the presenter today. And then we have uh, Virginia and Andrea in the chat and questions box to help with all of your burning questions about CMTS and all of your, uh, they're going to provide you some resources through that chat box. Um, so without further ado, let me launch this poll real quick. Let me see who we've got with us today. We did have a request for, for closed captioning, so I am looking at that as well. All right, looks like most of our folks have voted. I am still looking for the closed captioning. Andrea or Virginia, would you send Nathan an email real quick and ask him if he knows how to turn closed captioning on in the GoTo platform? All right, so it looks like almost everybody has answered. So what we are working with today, it's a whole lot of folks who use CMTS daily and weekly. So you guys are going to be almost professionals at the super pros. Um, for you guys that use it monthly and quarterly, um, you're probably still going to be pretty familiar with it. And so um, definitely reach out with any questions. And for those of you that said, what is CMTS? I can totally relate to that. And because um, there was a time where I did not know what this was. Um, so hopefully you get all your questions answered today, um, assuming you are in the right place. We are going to talk about the compliance monitoring tracking system with regards to how it's used at the Department for the Compliance Division. So if you're um, somebody, one of our housing partners that maybe doesn't work with the Compliance Division, this might not be the right training for you. If you are a tenant at a low income or affordable housing property, this might not be the right place for you because this is gonna be information um, that while you're welcome to stay, it might not be beneficial to you. Um, um, but if you are one of our housing partners, you're on site at an affordable housing community, you're in the compliance division, you are an owner, any, any of those kind of facets with our housing partners, um, this is definitely going to be beneficial information. This training is recorded and will be placed on our uh, department website and YouTube channel. 
hopefully by the end of the week, but we do have a holiday Friday. So if not this week, then early next week, this will be placed there and you'll be able to review it if you so choose or if you need a reference. The handout is down here at the bottom of your little uh, go-to meeting um, kind of sidebar. It says handouts one of five. You should be able to open that in your Internet Explorer that you choose to use, and then that should give you a place to save it. Um, we will be doing all of our questions through the questions box, and that is also on your little go-to meeting panel. So you'll want to pop that out maybe so you can you can answer it. You can ask questions. Uh, Virginia is going to be answering those. Andrea is going to be putting links in the chat box. And um, you should be able to use all of those resources uh, to help you going forward with this um, information that we are providing today. So without further uh, delay, let's get started. Some contact information for us. We've got our mailing address, which is that PO box that you see there. So if at any time you do need to mail something to the department, that is gonna be the, the mailing address that you wish to use. The physical address is that 221 East 11th Street, if you're ever in downtown Austin and you just wanna see uh, kind of what's going on and what um, where the magic happens, that is where to go. And um, we are oftentimes working remotely or we're traveling, so it's not a super super busy office anymore, um, but you can, you can drive by and take a look at it and wave at the building. Our website um, is the best resource I can give you. Andrea will put that link in the chat box. Um, the, the website is gonna have all the contact information for the department. Um, it's gonna have how to log into CMTS, where to go for um, signing up for the email notifications that the department sends out. It's gonna have just a wealth of information for you um, with regards to this training. Uh, the division's phone number is, oh, Andrea, that only went to organizers and panelists. You'll want to send it to entire audience. Thank you, though. Um, so our division phone number, if you're not sure who you need to talk to or you have a general question, you can, thank you, Andrea, you can call that uh, 3800 number, and then that is going to take you to um, kind of a switchboard type situation, and you'll click some buttons and uh, then you can ask to be connected to a compliance monitor. We also have a toll-free in Texas only phone number there that's listed on your screen. This, this PowerPoint is what is in the handout that's available to you. So the information that I'm sharing is not something you need to memorize or write down. The best, the best course of action would be to save that handout, um, print it if you want to take notes or take some side notes, but that handout is going to have all this information in it. The compliance monitoring and tracking system is a system that allows owners to submit required reports, like the unit status report, the annual owner's compliance report, um, and to submit documentation directly to the department. Part of why we are doing this training today, uh, for those of you that are um, you know, pros on the, on the housing partner side, this is the beginning of the month of April, and the annual owner's compliance report is due at the end of this month. So that is part of why um, Virginia and Andrea are our CMTS team, which is why they are here helping me with this so they can answer all your questions or help me to answer all your questions. Um, that is why we picked this day so that we could get you these resources at the beginning of the month um, versus towards the end of the month um, when the report is due like the next day. So definitely, definitely be aware that that deadline is coming. You can see the link that's on your screen now is the direct link to log into CMTS. There are a couple ways to get there if you don't have that direct link. But if CMTS is something you use on any type of regular basis, I would urge you to save this as a favorite um, so that you are able to easily access it. You don't have to go through those three extra clicking steps. And Andrea will put that link in the chat as well. So here is the long way to log into CMTS. You would go to our website, which is the tdhca.state.tx.us. Then you're going to click Support and Services, and it's going to pop out um, a little button that says Compliance. And then you're going to go to um, the online reporting, or you can click Compliance and use this sidebar right here. You can see on this sidebar, we've got our manuals and rules, forms, reports, training, utility allowances, income and rent limits, casualty loss, inspections, um, frequently asked questions, public comment, contact lists, sub-reciprocate monitoring, 
subrecipient monitoring survey that always gets me tongue twisted related websites and the email list so if you want to sign up for our email notifications that email list at the bottom is where to go for that and any of these other things are going to be great resources for you but what we're talking about today is this online reporting section right here so you would click this button that is the login to cmts button and that is going to take you to the login page which we'll talk about in a little more detail in just a second so cmts is used to report online so if you are if you are new or you've got a new property or you've got a new you're a management company taking over a property or you're an owner buying a property, you will need to get set up in CMTS. And so that is gonna require a filing agreement. There are instructions for adding buildings and units into CMTS. Any issues with CMTS need to be submitted via email to cmts.request at tdhca.state.tx.us. Um, and we will then process your request and send you an administrator of accounts ID if you don't already have one. Um, and a password that correlates with that. But you'll want to allow three to five business days to process your requests. There are times where we are able to respond to those more quickly, but that is not a guarantee. So please be aware that that three to five business days is what's going to need to be allowed for. Um, I do see that we have a question about how to access the handout on your GoToMeeting pop-out bar that should have been there um, when you logged in. At the very bottom, it's going to say handouts one of five. And Virginia just put that um, in there for you. So hopefully um, you're able to get that. If for some reason you can't, you can always email me um, after the training and I can send that to you. It will be available on our website with the recording of the training as well. The other thing that's available on our website are gonna be the CMTS user guidelines and resources. This is gonna have a document of how to attach, or a document explaining how to attach things into CMTS attachment system. And then it's going to have um, some instructions on how to upload your units if you choose to do it through a CVS document instead of, or CSV document. I'll say that on backwards too, um, versus doing it manually. This is also going to be the place where you do your online reporting. And we're going to talk about all these things, so don't panic yet. So you've logged into CMTS, but now we need to set up a report online. So you've got your login information there. But if you are new and you need to set up a re to report online, you will go to this section down here and you can see that it's got some links to the 2022 filing agreement, instructions for adding buildings, and then it's got a link to that email address. So if you don't remember it, didn't write it down or didn't save it, that is always going to be available to you right there. So if you have not received a user ID and password from the department, two steps are required to initiate online compliance reporting. First, you need to read, complete, and submit the CMTS filing agreement. And sometimes that does change. So you'll wanna be sure that you are getting that um, from the website versus using a saved one. I know we did just make some updates to that last year. You can now enter your buildings and units directly into CMTS, but you'll want to read the instructions for adding buildings and units for guidance. Um, and that's going to be something that's kind of between you and your IT group. Um, we are not able to offer a whole lot of support with regards to that. Um, we can offer some, but that's, um, that's kind of something we're doing as a courtesy versus a requirement. You will also then submit any uh, requests or issues to the CMTS request inbox and that will get processed uh, within three to five business days. Again, like I said, sometimes they are able to get to that more quickly, but you wanna be sure that you're allowing for that extra time just in case it is needed. Here's what that filing agreement is gonna look like. You can see page one is a whole lot of words, so you will definitely wanna read through that. The filing agreement is in the handout in full, so you don't have to um, try to read everything on this little screen. I know that would be a little bit cumbersome. And then we get into kind of the meat and potatoes of it. So we're gonna talk about the initial contact information, the amount of administrator of accounts designation, the reason for filing, and then there's some kind of um, required statements that have some yes or no answers. And then there's the signature of the owner that needs to be the actual development owner, and then the signature of the administrator of accounts that this form is um, adding. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the initial contact information. And you've got to do one of these for every single property that you're wishing to be added to. This isn't something um, that you would do and just say, I want anything with this management company or this type of thing. 
Um, that this is something that's property specific. It gets uploaded into the development's DMTS account so it can be tracked. So you're going to put the property name, the property address, the owner organization, the role of the owner representative. So whoever's acting as the owner's representative will also need to be listed there along with their email. You'll include the CMTS ID, which is going to be, um, it can be a two digit number, a three digit number or a four digit number, but it's going to be what you, you what is identified um, in CMTS. And then the city and the zip code. So the owner's representative that's included here, it needs to be an agent of the owner, not a management company, but the actual owner. This is who the person is going to, this is who the department is going to contact for ownership questions. We want the specific ownership organization as it's listed in the land use restriction agreement and CMTS, not the parent company that oversees the development. So on your land use restriction agreement, it is going to say, owned by such and such entity. That's gonna be the entity that should be listed here, not the big, you know, kind of bubble company. Um, this person should also match the signatory on page three. The next thing is where we're gonna talk about the administrator of accounts designation. So this is kind of a, a statement that says that you are authorized to make this a um, designation and that you understand that this person is going to have access to CMTS. So it says, I, owner's representative, right here in this line, um, designate the name of the owners, the administrator of accounts that you're adding for the above reference property as of the date of this agreement. So here's where the contact information for that person comes up. It's going to be the contact name the contact email, the contact organization. So if there's a management company or something like that, that's what would go there. And the effective date of the change. So if you say, hey, this management company has taken over May 1st, we don't want the change to happen until May 1st, that's the date that needs to go there. But if you are like, hey, we already have this management company, we need to get them access quickly, then you would put today's date so that we would know that that is uh, when that needs to be processed. The administrator of accounts is going to have the ability to submit the annual owner's compliance report, quarterly reports, and have all the same functions as a manager user. In addition, they also have the ability to reset the password for the manager user. An owner user will have the same rights as the administrator of accounts as outlined above. So if you're an owner that's also acting as the administrator of accounts, then you don't need two setups. You can, if you have somebody else in your office you want to designate as the administrator of accounts, you can do that. Um, but the owner, the owner rights are the same as the administrator of accounts rights, and they can both reset the password for your manager folks um, or your manager um, account. This date. I know I've already talked about it, but this is an incredibly important date. I should have clicked the arrow earlier. I apologize for that. But that is the date that this will be processed. It won't be processed sooner than that. The next thing we need to know is what's the reason for the submission? Is it an ownership change, a management company change, the addition of a third-party consultant, adding access for additional owner or management company staff? So maybe you need to have two administrators of accounts or you've got um, a dual ownership situation, or there's any other reason you could list there, and that's going to be up to the um, CMTS group to, to ask you any questions if they have questions or issues with that. My arrow is staying there. I apologize. I don't know why that is happening. So is the individual currently serving as an administrator of accounts for another property in the TDHCA portfolio? If they are, then you will say yes. And you will enter their username there. So it's going to be like admin 12345 or something to that effect. The manager accesses are specific to the property. They will not change per person. These administrator of accounts are specific to a person. If this is a new person and they've not been set up in CMTS before, they are not the administrator of accounts for any other properties, then you would say no here and you would move on. So this process is going to provide you with two levels of access. The first is going to be assigned to the manager of accounts and will begin with ADM. And the second is for the property manager and will begin with MGR. So if it's a new property, you're going to get both of those logins. And then it's the admin's um, administrator accounts responsibility to get that to the manager. 
Would you like a separate login for the owner? That's that's completely up to you guys as owners. That is not something that we tell you you have to do or don't have to do. So you'll say yes or no. If yes, and there's an existing ownership um, entity already, you would you would include that there. And it's I believe O W N E R. I think it's the word plus the numbers. If an administrator of accounts is currently assigned to the property, would you like to replace them? with the administrator of accounts designated above, you will say yes or no. And that lets us know that the new folks are taken over, that this is not an addition of persons. The last piece of the puzzle is that you have to sign off on it. So you can see there that it has to be emailed um, and that these are the folks that are gonna receive email notifications. And then you wanna have the owner's representative that was listed on that second page that we talked about sign and date it, and then the administrator of accounts that's being added to sign and date it, and then it needs to be sent to that email address for three to five, and allow for three to five business days. Is there anything, Andrea or Virginia, that you guys wanna to add to this section? Um, I have something, Kara. Okay. Um, when they when they select to remove the previous administrator, sometimes there are multiple administrators assigned. And if you know which one needs to be removed, write it on there. If you don't, and there's multiple ones, we will email you and ask you before we can process the filing agreement. All right, that's good to know. Um, and then I have this note here that unsigned forms are gonna be returned for corrections that would delay that setup process as well. I'm sorry, Virginia, did you have more you wanted to add? Oh, that's it, thank you. All right, thanks. This is why we have, have them here because they deal with this on a daily basis. So with regards to password reset, the owner or administrator of accounts can reset a manager user account password. The department will not reset manager user passwords unless there is a technical issue. The department can reset an owner or administrator of accounts password. You'll submit that request via email to the CMTS request inbox, and we will process your request and send you an administrator of accounts new password. This is an instance where, um, you know, I know that I know that Andre and Virginia try to get to these more quickly than three to five business days. Um, so if you have a situation and you've locked yourself out and you it's an emergency, so to speak, you can um, let them know that in that email that you submit and um, hopefully they can get to it a little bit sooner. But keep in mind that there is a three to five um, a business day allowance to process these requests. Any questions, any, uh, anything you guys want to add to this one? Yes, one more thing. Um, sure. The, the administrator has to be the person who requests the password reset. Just um, we get multiple um, people who, who request the password reset that are not the administrator for that account. Yes, and that actually made me think of something, Virginia. Thank you for bringing that up. I get emails from um, property managers asking me to please reset their password. Um, and I let them know, you know, hey, you need to reach out to the admin of accounts. I'm showing that it's this person through CMTS. And sometimes they respond with, oh, that person doesn't work here anymore, or oh, that person's on maternity leave. And so there's there needs to be kind of some checks and balances in there with that. Um, if the administrator of accounts leaves and does not is no longer available to be the administrator of accounts then you're going to need to um have somebody follow this process and take that you know kind of initiative to um be the new administrator of accounts did i say that right virginia yes that is correct is that but there is if they have someone out on maternity leave and they need access especially right now because of the AOCR, we will grant them temporary access and then we will remove, we will uh, reset the password after the allotted amount of time. Okay, great, that's good to know, thank you. Did anybody have any questions on passwords or anything? I saw we had one hand raised. If you'll put your 
question in the chat box. That way we can get your question answered. All right. So with regards to a management company update, after logging into CMTS, you have the ability to update the management company information when you are the owner and the admin of accounts by following the steps below. You will select update contact information for the new property on the property listings page. You will select update management information. The next screen will display the current management company's information. It is important to select delete if you are, so say Poli property management is the old management and Tucker property management is the one coming in. You wanna delete Poli management and then add uh, Tucker management in so that you don't accidentally leave an old phone number or an old email address or anything like that. Once the prior company's information has been deleted, you will then have the option to select add to the right of the line name. On the next screen, you will enter new company's name, then enter the new company's name, the tax ID, and submit query. If the organization is currently entered into CMTS, you will select that organization and assign it to the development. If it is not, you would select add organization and enter the necessary information and then assign it to the development. Failure to delete the prior management company as directed above before changing any information will cause errors in CMTS and will not update the management company as desired. So you can see this little button here that has delete. So you need to be sure that you are clicking delete. Now, if it's that the management company changed names, you would click edit, or if a phone number changed or that kind of a thing, you could do edit. But if you need to remove that management company, you need to click delete. Anything you guys wanna to add to that stuff, Virginia, Andrea? No, I think we're good. Okay, thank you both. So the next thing we're going to talk about is attaching documents into CMTS. So we're going to go through this step by step. I know a lot of you do this on a regular basis, so you're probably pretty familiar with it. Um, but a lot of folks run into issues on this, even the, the housing partners that have been around forever run into issues with this. So we're going to talk about some of the common errors, kind of how to mitigate those, and, and what to do if you can't um, get this to work as it is intended. So there's a document on our website, as you can see there. That's what this, this document's gonna look like this, and the process has not changed. So the document is, is a little bit, you know, outdated is probably not the right term, but it is, it might have people in it that, you know, are not here anymore, but it is an accurate document. You can find that at that link at the bottom of the screen, or you can click it from the um, online reporting website. So to ensure that information is properly entered into CMTS, please review the available references on our website. We put a lot of those things out there and we work very hard to make sure that things that will help you are available. Um, we know sometimes you guys work outside of our regular business hours. Sometimes you guys are working and I'm on a monitoring trip or Virginia is on a monitoring trip and you can um, reach out, you can review our website and sometimes you can find a lot of the resources that you would need um, versus having to wait until one of us comes back. So we're gonna go step by step. You're gonna log into CMTS. That's the first step to attaching a document in CMTS. You're then gonna select the property and you're gonna click attachments at the far right. Now this is a manager's um, view of this. This is not the um, admin of accounts or owner's view. They would have stuff here and here. So once you've clicked attachments, you're gonna go into the attachment system. And most of yours is gonna look a little different than this because you've got at least one or two things in there. Um, unless you are truly a brand new property and you are in this training to learn how to do the filing agreement, which is perfect. That's why we're doing this. You will click attach a document right here in this red circle. That is then gonna bring up this type of page and it, you're gonna say in the type, you're gonna tell it what it is. So if it's pre on-site documentation because you've got a monitoring review, if it's UPCS corrective action, file corrective action, um, if it is a CMT access, CMTS access document, if it's utility allowance documents, AOCR part D attachments, you can see there's lots of stuff listed there. 
If it's not listed, if what you're uploading is not listed, select other and let's move on. We don't need to make a huge deal out of this unless it's for utility allowance documents and then you need to be sure you select the right one. In the description, you're gonna to wanna to type a brief description. Um, you want to say, like this example says, corrective action um, due on such and such date from the monitoring review from this date. Something that, something that tells us what's in the document and what's uploaded so that we can um, kind of know before we open it, what is this gonna to go to? The next thing you're gonna do is select a TDHCA contact. All of the folks that use CMTS within the department, not just the compliance division, but the physical division, um, all the folks are listed here that would need to have something uploaded to CMTS. It, they are not in alphabetical order, so if you cannot find your person, go one by one down the line. Um, and I, I don't know what order they're in, probably the order that they were set up in CMTS. Um, but that is the... If you can't find the person and you've gone through it, reach out to a monitor and um, we can help you figure out, you know, if that person's not listed or we can kind of give you a different directive. Maybe the person's new, they're not listed, or maybe it's an entity that doesn't regularly use CMTS, whatever the case may be, we can help with that. But I think everybody that uses CMTS is pretty well set up in there. The next step is gonna be to select, to upload your actual file. You want to select browse. You can see the maximum file size has changed from 10 megabytes to 15. Um, so you can upload that. We're going to talk about how to check your file size. So don't panic on me there. That's, that's um, something I was not familiar with until we set this training up. You cannot have special characters in the file. So if your property is called Kara's with an apostrophe place, when you upload documents, take the apostrophe out. You do not want to upload with that. It will not let you, it will give you an error. So you wanna be sure that you've got a clean file name and the, that the file is under 15 megabytes. And so this is what it's gonna look like. You can see here, we've got utility allowance documents, 2021 utility allowance submission for Pandora Springs, energy consumption model, annual review to the TDHCA contact of utility allowance. Then we we're gonna choose our file. Um, but when uploading, this is just a note, when uploading for utility allowance review, please select the TDHCA contact of utility allowance. Most other submissions will have a specific TDHCA contact. So to check your file size, you're going to right click on the document that you wish to upload. You're going to scroll down and select properties. That's going to give you this pop-up that you can see there where it says, um, that the document is 138 kilobytes. So that's smaller than the 15 megabytes. So we are good to upload that. Are there any questions before we talk about errors, Virginia? We are good, thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> So for error messages, you're gonna get a little thing that looks like this where it says internal service error and it's gonna tell you all this information. A lot of times that is because there's a file size issue. It has a special character like a money sign or a pound sign or a percentage or an ampersand, an ampersand or an apostrophe or a comma. You wanna make sure the file name is not too long. CMTS gets cranky when you tell it too many words. So you wanna be sure that you are being as concise as you can in your file names. Um, we're gonna open the document and if we need to rename it, we're gonna rename it. So you guys can put, you know, a lot of times what we call it is the CMTS number, um, underscore the property name, underscore, and then kind of a shorthand for what it is. So if you guys are curious about how that works and you want more information to align your, your document nine, names with that, reach out, we can help you with that. But it doesn't, it's not that serious, but you wanna be sure that it's not too lengthy, it's the right file size, and it doesn't have special characters. If the above items are not the issue, you have checked it, you do not have special characters, your file is smaller, you've restarted your Internet Explorer, your file name is short, um, and you are still having issues with the upload, you can always email CMTS request inbox for assistance. 
You can also email the department contact that you're uploading to and ask for assistance. So if we have, if I have scheduled a monitoring review for your property and you are not able to submit the documentation to me as requested because of a CMTS error, reach out to me. Maybe there's a global error. Maybe there's a situation with CMTS. Maybe there's, um, maybe I can see something that you're not seeing in the file name. Maybe I've just been made aware of something. So let me know or let the monitor know that you're dealing with so that they are aware because maybe they can help you out as well. Are there anything, other things you guys want to add for um, errors, Andrea and Virginia? No, we are good. Thank you. All right. Hopefully that means we're getting the information presented in a good way, not that everybody's minds are blown and they don't know what I'm talking about. So with regards to setting up buildings, there is a CMTS unit upload feature for uploading household and tenant data from other systems into CMTS. You will wanna read the instructions, which is the PDF on the left side of your screen. As, as mentioned in the first page of that document, the file layouts and field definitions for the CMTS unit upload feature are contained in the CMTS unit upload specification. You wanna be sure that when you are setting your buildings up, that you do not use the dash in the bin number. I believe that has most recently started causing some issues. Virginia can correct me if I'm wrong or misremembering that. You wanna be sure that the data matches um, what's there and what's required um, based off of this upload specification requirements, but those bin numbers should not have dashes. Um, we have to go in and take those out because it's causing an issue with the AOCR being able to be submitted. You can see those two document links are at the bottom. And then Andrea has already put the link in to the compliance reporting website. And these are also available on that website. This is not mandatory, but it is an option available. You can also enter the information unit by unit in CMTS. Um, you can, if, if your system talks to CMTS and you have um, a multiple building project, you might have to go in and adjust transfer dates. So you might have to keep some other side lists. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then ignore this. And we can talk about it if you have questions on the back end. Um, it has to do with some building requirements for, for different programs. But you want to be sure that if, if your system is talking to CMTS, that your system is giving it the right information because that unit status report still needs to be accurate and correct. With regards to setting up buildings, when you are setting up buildings in CMTS, please do not include the dash in the building identification numbers. The dash is causing errors on reporting and documents within CMTS. So if a monitor finds that the bins contain that dash mark, we will have to remove them and notify the property contacts. This will become an issue with the property's operating system links directly to CMTS for uploads. So you guys would have to make those edits on a regular basis unless you're able to tell your operating system to take those out before it, it continues to talk to CMTS. Are there anything you guys want to add, Andrea, Virginia, before we start talking about reporting requirements? No, ma'am, we are good. Thank you. All right. So there are different reporting requirements as required in uh, the TINTAC section 10.607. The first one is the annual owner's compliance report, and that's the AOCR. It's due April 30th. There are five parts for some developments and four for all. The part A is the owner certification of program compliance. Part B is a current unit status report. And the report that's due now is going to be data as of 12-31-2022. So what a lot of folks do is they submit that at the be early on so that they don't have to hold their unit status report until then. Um, and then part C is going to be housing for, per housing for persons with disabilities report. Part D is the annual owner's financial certification, and Part E is Form 8703. So if you have a tax-exempt bond from the department, you are going to have to submit the 8703, and you're going to upload those to Charles Stites uh, when you upload those into CMTS. If you don't know that whether or not you have to submit those forms, go ahead and submit them or reach out to Charles, and he can uh, give you guidance on that. 
Quarterly vacancy reports are due in January, April, July, and October on the 10th of those months. If the 10th of the month falls on a weekend or a holiday, then the due date defaults to the next business day. So like for April, the 10th is Monday. So it's due on that Monday. Um, and then I don't have a July, oh, I do have a July calendar. It's also on a Monday. So that doesn't help with you guys this year. That's, that doesn't make my example work. The report must show occupancy as of the last day of the previous month for the reporting period. For example, the quarterly report due October 10th should report occupancy as of September 30th. The first quarterly report is due January 10th, reflecting occupancy as of December 31st of the previous year. If you do not see these um, triggered in your CMTS reporting section, we're gonna look at that in just a second, um, then you're gonna wanna email that CMTS request. This is another part that we are also confirming when we do a monitoring review, we are looking to make sure that these are triggered correctly, has the most recent one been submitted. So these will start being issues of non-compliance if you guys are not submitting them as required. Um, I know some of them had some funky dates, and this is something that is required. The annual owner's reports and the quarterly vacancy reports are required for all department properties regardless of funding. So if you are at home development or you are a tax credit development, you are still gonna have to do these two things. So with regards to CMTS reporting, you can see there the long way to get to our uh, reporting log login. You go to the website, support and services, compliance, online reporting, and then it's going to take you to this. You're going to click login. It's going to take you to the login page. You can also see from that page that we've got some annual owners compliance report resources. So it talks a little bit in depth about each one of these things. Um, there's a presentation about it. It hasn't changed a whole, whole lot. And then um, there's kind of a cheat sheet. If you are having issues with getting your report to submit, the first step is to go through and make sure that everything is completed on the report, um, that all the questions are answered, and that everything is submitted as required. Um, a lot of times that's the issue, that a question gets overlooked and it doesn't get answered, and so it's going to tell you that it can't submit because this answer is not there, uh, that sort of thing. So these are a lot of times going to be the questions that you run into. The so where you're going to go to get this is going to be when you are an owner or admin login, you are going to look at this, um, this box right here. It's going to tell you the annual owner's compliance report, and this year it would say 2022. That's what you're going to click. It's going to pop this up. So you're going to want to start the new report, edit and view before submission, whatever your process is, preview the report is available on some of them. Um, so for the, like I said, the unit status report, that one is super easy because it's you're at, at the beginning of the year when you're doing that quarterly report and this one, go ahead and submit those pieces if this is available. Sometimes this one's not ready to go quite that soon. Um, so you might have to wait on that. I totally get that. You can also see that there are some instructions um, there at the bottom that are available. So if you run into issues on those two, that's the annual owner's compliance report and the annual owner financial certification, those are um, available as well on this. So for the quarterly vacancy report, these, um, you're gonna click that unit status report button when you see all your properties listed. It's gonna take you to the submit report. You're gonna see this as your um, kind of top line on your Internet Explorer. So you're gonna hit submit reports. It's gonna take you to a page that looks like this. You can see the quarterly vacancy report um, is going to be 7-10-2021 and then 10-10-2021 has not been submitted, so you would preview before submitting. And if you wanted to look at that July one, you would look at the PDF or the Excel. You can see here that the annual owner's compliance report for USR is also there, so you could preview that before submitting. You could do those two in the same place. For some CMTS reports for monitoring, you'll go to the unit status report, and then you'll go to submit reports, just like we did here. And you'll see this at the top of the page. And then you're gonna wanna scroll down. But remember I said, if you're a manager account, you're only gonna see this much. You're gonna see the attachments, 
reports, update contact information. So if the property phone number changes, um, you're going to be able to update that. The unit status report you're going to be able to see, but you're not going to be able to do anything with the 8609s or the annual owner's compliance report. So we've got our unit status report. We're going to click unit status reports. And then, oh, and then you can see there's lots of things there. So if you have, oh, this is for the monitoring review questionnaire. Sorry, I should have read my headers. I apologize. So for the monitoring review questionnaire, unless we have other questions to address before um, we move on, Virginia, Andrea, anything? So I want to go back to the AOCR, um, but we get a lot of errors that come back because they do not complete the other program section because they think they don't have other programs. Even if they don't have other programs, they need to complete that section. Also, okay. when they're in the, the beginning of part A, when they're entering in the property update, even though the address hasn't changed, they still have to enter in the property address so that they can enter in the longitude and latitude. If those are not done, you will not be able to submit the report. Oh, and that's a new thing, right? The longitude yes. and latitude? Yes. Okay. Did you anything else you wanted to add on any of this that I've gone through? Nope. Everything else is great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see we're getting lots of questions about the quarterly vacancy report. So if you are running in, into issues on that, definitely reach out to um, any one of the three of us. We can put our chat, our email addresses in the chat. Um, we're happy to help where we can. Um, or you can email that CMTS inbox, and they can they can offer you some guidance from there. So with regards to the monitoring review questionnaire, so you've gotten our letter. We, I have said, hey, I'm coming out to your property on April the 30th. And uh, well, it wouldn't be April the 30th. Let me just point out that's a Sunday. So April 26th, I'm coming to your property. So I need some documentation ahead of time. You're going to go to the pro whoever's responsible for this, for submitting that and updating those reports. It's going to go into CMTS. They're going to click the unit status report. They're going to then click unit status report again when they get to this page. Then they're going to scroll down when they see this. They're going to scroll like they almost are done. And they're going to see monitor review questionnaire. You can also see the UPCS required notification is there. So there's a lot of information if you scroll down. And for those of you that have been around for a long time, you know that some of these properties um, get a lot of reports on this first section with all the quarterly reports and the annual reports and the monitoring review reports. Those are going to, you're going to have to scroll. It's going to be um, a long ways down there because this stuff's at the bottom. So then you can see on the monitoring review questionnaire, if you've got a monitoring review, you're going to have the option to um, start edit view before submission. So you'll want to click that so that you can answer the questions. Oh, and the April 30th comment that was made, I misunderstood that. I apologize, Rafaela. Um, the, April 30th is on Sunday, so the AOCR, uh, Virginia can, can answer this. Does that mean that the AOCR is due still by April 30th because they've had four months to enter it, or is does it default to the next business day? That's what I was trying to find out. Huh? Oh, I was trying to find that out. Um, I just okay. asked Lucy, she hasn't responded back yet. Okay, so we'll get back to y'all on that. Um, I, I know this came up with regards to utility allowance submissions last year. Um, somebody asked since October 1st was, I think, like a Saturday or something. They asked if they could get it in the next business day. Um, and the answer was you had nine months to submit it. I understand and utility allowances are a little bit different um, than that. So I don't know if that's the answer for AOCRs or not. I know that is the answer for utility allowances. It does not change. Uh, the requirement for an October 1st or by October 1st submission. So with regards to the monitor review questionnaire, if you have not seen our new monitor review questionnaire, please go to the presentation section of our website. I don't know if Andrea has put that in the chat already, but if she has it, um, she can or I can get that to you and watch the presentation. It is a lot different than the one that was in place before December of 2022. So this is a new process. It is. It puts it all on you guys 
So when you go through this and you start edit or view before submission, at the bottom, it's gonna tell you what's due for your monitoring review. You need to take a screenshot of that. You need to print that. You need to um, do a snippet where you can um, save that so that you know what's printed because our letter is not gonna ask for all that stuff anymore. So you're gonna, that is gonna be your responsibility now. Um, I don't see any questions about the monitor review. Um, if there are any, feel free to type them in. We're not in a hurry here. The other thing you've got in CMTS is the attachment. So you wanna be sure um, for those of you that have multiple properties that you're selecting the right property because if you upload to the wrong property, I'm not necessarily gonna see it when I'm looking for my monitoring review. Um, and we get a lot of the notifications that says something was uploaded to your attention in CMTS, so we're not always able uh, to review those. Oh, okay, I see the answer there. Um, so you wanna be sure that you are selecting the right property and following that attachment protocol that we had talked about earlier. You can see here what it looks like once something's been uploaded. So we would. this is what my view of CMTS looks like. I, I know that a lot of you get this, the attachment was successfully uploaded, but please note there's no email address associated with the role that you selected. You don't have to panic on that. We have a process in place, but if, so if you uploaded that to utility allowance and you get this uh, notification, that's okay. We have a UA team that reviews those. Um, if you upload it, I know the last time I had documents due for me, somebody accidentally uploaded it to CA submissions instead of CARA. I think they were typing the CA and just hitting enter. They got in a hurry or, or didn't realize there was a contact in there like that. That is not going to notify me. So you would need to notify me of that. Um, but if, if you get this and you did exactly what you were instructed to do, you can email the person that instructed you to do it, but you can also trust the process. Um, but I understand the whole trust but verify. So I don't mind getting those emails from those of you that get this and, and question it just to make sure it got where it needed to go. The attachment system is used by the department for a number of purposes. This is the digital filing cabinet for the property and gonna be used by various divisions, compliance, physical inspections, asset management, fair housing complaints, et cetera. Um, and we're gonna use that to communicate with the development. It should be monitored regularly and anything uploaded into the system to the property's attention should be responded to accordingly. If our fair housing division sends you a request for your written policies and procedures or your affirmative fair marketing housing plan, that sort of thing, respond to them. That is just as serious as if a compliance monitor asks you for monitoring review communication. So you wanna be sure that you are looking at those things, you are seeing the due dates, this is another reason that it is super important for the on-site staff to have an email address, for the ownership group to have an email address, and for the management group to have an email address in CMTS so that multiple people are notified. You can have folks keeping an eye on this. I know when I was an on-site manager, I would log in and I would check this on like Fridays or Thursdays, kind of depending on when my schedule freed up to be sure that there wasn't anything new that I had missed or that I needed to respond to. A lot of times our compliance folks had already gotten it and were already working on it, but I wanted to be sure that as an on-site person, I was doing my due diligence to make sure that I was being as helpful as I needed to be. When documentation is uploaded into CMTS by the department, only the email addresses associated with the property, the ownership entity, and the management company will be notified by email. If the company or group would like more than one person notified of uploads, then that is the company or group's responsibility to set up an email address that would allow more persons to be notified. Only one email address can be entered for each of these contacts. So if the ownership entity has three people they want set up, they would need to have a compliance at ownershipentity.com email address that would then go to all three of those persons. Management companies, same thing. They would need to have a compliance app, property management, or however you guys want to word that. Um, we see that with a lot of companies nowadays um, that y'all have this kind of umbrella email that then goes to, you know, in some cases, eight or 10 people so that the parties that are need to be aware of it are made aware of that upload into CMTS and they are not just sitting there waiting for somebody who might be on vacation or who might be on a maternity leave or, you know, with home with a sick kid or something, they miss an important document. You want to be sure 
that you guys have a process in place to make sure that CMTS is being monitored uh, with regards to the attachment system and required due dates. There has been a change to the, the monitoring rules. Um, so within 10 days of a change, this is not the change, that's always been required. Within 10 days of a change in the contact information, including persons, physical addresses, mailing addresses, email addresses, uh, phone numbers, and or the name of the property as known by the public. So if it was Harris Place and now it is Landry Townhomes, that needs to be updated because when we come out to do a monitoring review, we're going to be looking for Harris Place. And if that's wrong, we're just going to keep driving by. We're going to call the number. Um, and if that goes to a different property, we're not going to necessarily know that that's a change that has happened. Um, that means CMTS needs to be updated. The change in the rule is that now separate contact information must be provided for the ownership entity, the management company, and an on-site manager at the development. A single contact may be used for the owner and management if they are the same entity. Failure to do this is an issue of non-compliance. So if you are an ownership group that owner manages, I, in my opinion, you and most other monitors, you should still have a person at the ownership level that is responsible for these things. And then you should have a person at the management level that is responsible for those contact information so that it is not one email address for all three contacts getting an email, which means that nobody is gonna actually get notified if that one person is out of the office. The other thing is make sure the phone number is the phone number to the property. It should not be your management company. When we as compliance monitors come out to monitor your property, we take that compliance profile sheet or that phone number um, on our travel schedule and that's the phone number we're gonna call. So if I'm sitting in Littlefield, Texas and I can't get a hold of the property and all I can do from CMTS is get a hold of the management company and whoever at the management company is not answering, we've got a situation and I'm stuck in Littlefield, Texas unable to complete a monitoring review. So make sure that CMTS has the correct information. Make sure we can call a lot of the newer properties. Um, go in and look. Your address probably still says the corner of 35th and Blanco Street. Your phone number is probably not there because maybe it didn't exist when your property was set up in CMTS. I saw one yesterday that the fax, phone number, and email are all the property email address. That's going to be problematic when I go to that property next week and I can't get a hold of them because all I have is an email address. And we don't put our emails on our cell phones. So we will be kind of a sitting duck there with no contact information for that property. I'll get off my soapbox now. The other change with regards to the rule is that owners must submit IRS Forms 8609 with Part 2 complete through CMTS by the second monitoring review. If the owner elects to group the buildings together into one or more multiple building projects, the owner must attach a statement identifying the buildings within the project. So you want to be sure when you get your 86 through nines, you get them completed. They're usually routed after the first monitoring review along with some other steps, but you want to be sure that you are getting those processed and uploaded into CMTS once they're complete. Some pointers and keys to success. Owners are encouraged to continuously maintain current resident data in the CMTS um, system. This is because that links to our vacancy clearinghouse, which is something that um, low-income Texans use regularly to locate apartments in the area they wish to move. Um, this also helps us if we have a complaint or a situation that we need to pull up a current unit status report. If you've got a current unit status report, we are gonna be able to pull all that information. All rental developments funded or administered by the department will be required to submit a current unit status report prior to an on-site monitoring visit or a desk monitoring review. Within 10 days of any change, the contact information, including contact persons, physical addresses, mailing addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, or the name of the property um, for the ownership entity management company and or development must be updated. And you wanna remember that an up-to-date CMTS is a happy CMTS because it's gonna mean that when we request documentation, you guys know your stuff's already in there. It's already up to date, you're current. So you're good to go. That is all that I have um, with regards to this training. And look, Andrea or Virginia have anything or we've had any questions. Um, 
if I, I see one of the questions is what if an owner's name changes? <coughs> and Virginia answered that the ownership changes will be entered by the department's asset management group. A link has been put in the chat with a list of asset managers. Uh, we talked about the 8703 point of contact. What type of properties have the quarterly report requirement? All properties that are funded or administered by the department have the um, ownership or the quarterly report requirement. And if this next question is I'm in compliance, how do I know that the property had entered all the tenant data before I submit the unit status report? That is an internal function that you guys are going to need to have within your company. And when you're submitting the unit status report, it will not let you submit it if it's incomplete. And we won't know if it's inaccurate. That will be something that you are going to have to work with your on-site folks for. But if it's incomplete, it will not let you submit it. Virginia, did we get a question on whether or not the AOCR is going to default to a May 1st due date or is it still due by April 30th? I have not. Um, Amy and I sent it to Amy too and Wendy, they're, they're both busy so they haven't responded yet. I'm going to, in, to err on the side of caution, say that it's still going to be an April 30th at the due date. I'm not, so maybe work on it that last week of April if you don't have everything ready to go, but I would, I'm going to just say that since we can't get an answer, let's, let's assume that that's due by April 30th. So the next question is when submitting the unit status report for AOCR, should we pull the USR for the same date we are submitting the AOCR or should we pull the USR for the last date of the um, compliance year? And that's gonna need to be data from the end of, so the one that's due right now needs to be data from 12-31-2022. When is the first quarterly and annual report due after Lisa? Those quarterly report reports start when you start Lisa. And the annual owner's compliance report is due the second year. Is that right, Virginia? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rafaela. Either way, you'll make sure to have it submitted by April 30th. I, I know that's true. Um, the Previously and in the past, if you were to add a date to the USR at the end of the month, it would still populate for the date you would submit the report. Has this been fixed or has any complaints about this received to y'all? That's going to be a Virginia question. We're at, let me go back and look at it. Hold on. I'm to Second to the last way. one. Either way, we'll be sure to have that. Oh, that's the last one I show. Oh, hold on. Oh, there we go. Let me go up. Ah. When is the first quarterly report? No. What was uh, the so question? It starts with previously in the past. I'm not seeing that one. Maybe they sent it directly. Oh, there it is. Previously okay. in the past, if you were to, there you go. Uh, add the date of the USR of the end of the month, it would still populate the date you would submit the report. Um, it, and that's fine. It's okay. It has, I, I don't think it's been fixed, but that's fine. Okay. And you did indicate that they could have multiple administrators for a property. Is that correct? Multiple, but we don't want it to get crazy. Right. Mm hmm. And maybe okay. you know an additional a second one, um, and then maybe an owner one. I heard some updates to CMTS were in the works. Would these updates allow for 100% home sites to upload tenant data? At the moment, they cannot be uploaded because they do not have bins. Um, home doesn't have bins. Home doesn't have bins, but you can't use that CSV file without bins. Oh yeah, they have yeah, that's true. So they have to do that. Hey, I'm gonna ask you to email me on that one. How do we get an additional admin login and not an owner? Virginia, take it away. You can have an additional admin. You just have to submit another uh, filing agreement and make sure you do not select to remove the previous admin.
if this year we completed our obligations for the housing tax credit exchange program, when would we remove it from CMTS and what other updates would we need to make? You will need to email me on that one. That is very property specific. Any other questions? I think we've answered everything that's come through. Oh, what or who is the syndicator when updating the property information? Just want to be sure. So we don't keep the syndicator information in there that I'm aware of, unless that's your ownership group. So that is going to be something that would be an instance where if the syndicator wants to also be emailed, you're going to need to have one of those umbrella email addresses with a um, link to multiple email addresses after they email that one. Right, Virginia, that's not, we don't have a syndicator place. No. Okay. Underneath the CMTS, it asks for an updater, updated syndicator update. That's on the AOCR. That's on the AOCR. So that yeah. that is that is the update. Um, that is where that would be updated, not in CMTS uh, contact. Right. It's been a long time since I've done an AOCR. Any other questions? Thank you guys for all your good questions and thanks for being with us today. How can we verify if we already have an account? Send an email to uh, cmts.request. All right. I I'm not seeing anything else. It's about five after 10. No, thank you. I'm happy to present these. I hope you guys find them helpful. Um, and for the person that requested closed captioning, I'm so sorry that I was not able to get that um, done. I will email you and, and we will figure out how to get you a transcript of this. Uh, the training is over unless you have, unless there are other questions. Um, I want to thank Andrea and Virginia for being here with me today. If you have other questions, please feel free to send those by email. Andrea put all of our email addresses in the chat. There is not a copy of this training that will be emailed out, but if you are signed up, to receive our email notifications, which you can do from our website, our main page over on the far left, there's a gray um, kind of a, 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 a menu. You'll click um, join email list and that will tell you, that'll give you the information to log in. And there will be a listserv announcement that goes out to the folks registered for that email list uh, when this training is uploaded to our website and our YouTube channel. Um, it will probably be, I'm going to try to get it up there tomorrow, uh, but if it's not up there tomorrow or Thursday, then it'll probably be early next week. I've got some other things going on. Um, if you, I think I have a survey set up for this one at the end. I'm not 100% certain. If a survey does pop up, please fill that out for me. Um, I use those survey responses to tell me like what you guys want new training on, what you guys want these other little mini trainings to be about. That's kind of what drives these. So I appreciate your responses there. I feel like I did set one up for this one. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. So Virginia, Andrea, thank you so much for spending the morning with me. Thank you all for spending your morning with me. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your week and we will 
see you again next time. I'm going to end the training. Thank you. Thank you, guys.